to carry it over a wide radius. This radio wave is then sent to the antenna from which it is released. It leaves the antenna as vibrations and travels in all directions with the speed of light. The wave spreads out for hundreds of miles and finally your own aerial picks up a small amount of the original vibrations. Radio waves from many programs are being picked up by your radio all the time. You can select any one you wish by merely tuning in your set to receive the same number of vibrations as a particular station is broadcasting. The radio wave is picked up by the aerial on your car and is carried into the radio set. This wave is still a combination of sound and carrier waves and your radio set must separate them. This is done in a little device called the detector tube. You've seen one in your own radio. This detector cuts off the bottom part of the wave so that if we follow the top line of what's left, we have an audio current wave exactly like the one we made in the studio. Then the other tubes amplify this current. And as it reaches your loudspeaker, it moves the diaphragm back and forth and is translated into a very good likeness of the sounds you would hear in the studio. Listen. You are invited to listen to this program at this same time next week, when we will again present Rubinoff and his violin.
Open research. Open research is the concept of scientists sharing their research with the world as soon as they record it for themselves. This is essential to make research more efficient than it is today. Research resembles a puzzle. A heap of pieces has to be assembled into a coherent picture. Yet some of the pieces are unknown, and traditional non-open science keeps much of the remainder hidden behind barriers erected by pre-digital reputation and reward systems. Open science means tackling research problems collaboratively by sharing research tools, data, materials, and code as they arise, and by building on the shared work. As Beethoven said, there should be only one repository of research in the world to which the artist would donate his works in order to take what he would need. Ideally, scientific research would be in the public domain by default, and Beethoven's repository would be federated rather than centralized. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up a compound binocular microscope. First of all, plug in the microscope. Then, select the low power objective. The low power objective is usually colored red. Then, we need to put the specimen on the microscope slide onto the stage of the microscope. This is the stage. So carefully sit the specimen on the stage making sure that the microscope slide is the correct way up. The next thing we need to do is set the eye distance on the binocular piece of the microscope. This should be the distance between your eyes. And then we're ready to turn the microscope on. Next, we need to ensure that the eyepieces are correctly focused. So look down the microscope, look down both of the binocular pieces of the microscope at the same time. And you need to hold the focus button, which is at the back of the microscope. Focus carefully on the specimen. And first of all, you need to focus looking down the right-hand eyepiece. So close your left eye and focus the specimen only looking down the right-hand eyepiece. When the specimen's in focus, then close your right eye and look down the left-hand eyepiece and again focus the specimen, but this time using the focus setting on the eyepiece. Don't touch the microscope focus setting. Next we have to focus the condenser lens. The condenser lens sits above the light source and it focuses the light source onto the specimen. The way that we focus the condenser lens is we take something with a sharply defined tip like a pen or pencil and we carefully hold it over the light source. So we put the pencil above the light source and then we look down the microscope and we focus the condenser lens using this button here we turn it up or down we look down the microscope eyepiece and what we want to see is both the specimen and the tip of the pencil in focus and, we, and that we achieve by moving the condenser lens focus button here the microscope is now ready to view specimens there are a couple of things that you need to be aware of while using the microscope. First of all, always look down both of the binocular pieces. Don't close your eye and just look down one at a time. You should, when you look down both binocular pieces, see a nice circular field. And if you can't see a circular field, then the distance between the eyepieces is incorrect and you need to alter it. Secondly, you need to change between objectives very carefully. This microscope has a low power objective 
of times 4 or times 10, so it's got two quite low power objectives. The times 4 is usually red, the times 10 is usually yellow, and high power objectives of times 40 and times 100. When you change the objective lens, make sure you hear it click into place over the specimen. Finally, be very careful when you focus the specimen on the stage. As you focus the specimen, the stage rises up. So be very careful if you have a large objective lens in there that you don't raise the stage so much that you crack the specimen. My next car gets 100 miles per gallon. I'm Joe Justice. I'm a Seattle area software consultant, and I'm a member of Team Wikispeed. Team Wikispeed has built a fast, affordable, ultra efficient, safe, fun commuter car. And the first prototype, functional prototype, was built in three months. How is that possible when existing cars seem to change so slowly? Here we see over a six-year period, a mainstream hybrid car achieved an additional two miles per gallon. Existing manufacturing processes are slow because they're very expensive to change. If an engineer wanted to redesign this door tomorrow, they would need to wait 10 years to first pay off the current door mold before making another one or else lose millions of dollars. Manu this is not uncommon in manufacturing teams for them to run on 10 to 25 year development cycles. Old software teams used to run the same way. We use seven day development cycles. This is how new software teams run, and it allows us to make changes very quickly. In 2008, the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize announced a $10 million prize purse and an international challenge to see if it were even possible to build 100 mile per gallon cars to road legal safety specifications. The closest thing we had in 2008 were like bobsleds. <laughs> they achieved more than 100 miles per gallon, but they held one occupant and they didn't meet road legal safety requirements. <laughs> I joined the X Prize too, but in the beginning it was just me but I decided to blog about everything that went well and everything that didn't go well and everything I was learning. And through social networking tools, a team came to assist. And three months later, we had the car that we campaigned in the X Prize and a volunteer team of 44 team members in four countries. We tied for 10th in the mainstream class. That meant we outlasted more than 100 other cars from companies and universities around the world. We do this by modeling our team to develop the car after modern software teams. We use techniques with funny sounding names like Agile, Lean, and Scrum. These methods all help us make changes quickly. Right after the X Prize, we were invited to the largest auto show in the world, January 2011 in Detroit, Michigan. We knew we wanted a more beautiful car, a more aesthetic car, but we also knew that for one car body, it would cost us at least $36,000 and three months lead time. So I took time off my day job and I went to composite school. I came back to the team and we made small models of the car and iterated a composites process that ended up letting us build our car body in structural carbon fiber in three days for $800. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs> they put us on the main floor of the auto show between Ford and Chevrolet. Lucky for us, the car was beautiful. That car went on to be featured on the Discovery Channel, 
Popular Science, Popular Mechanics, The New York Times Online, uh, the National Geographic Channel, Wired Magazine, the Forbes Billionaire Club linked to us, and others. Now, and this has been a six-month time span, most of what I'm talking about. Now, Rob Moorbacher, who, learns, who leads our Germantown, Maryland team, is producing our production convertible city car mold. So how do we do it? We're modular. The engine is able to be switched from a gasoline to electric engine in about the time it takes to change a tire. The car body switches from a convertible to a pickup truck. This lets us make changes and develop quickly. Here you can see our chassis, our frame, holds all the modules together. That chassis is the lightest chassis in the world to achieve a five-star crash rating equivalency. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> We're safe because we design safety tests for our parts before we even build them. In fact, we design tests for all of our parts before we build them. We take this from test-driven development in the software world. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> we use less stuff wherever we can. Here, Rob Huggins, a Seattle area uh, recent high school graduate, is saving up for college, and he's able to build a Wikispeed car by using an $89 bandsaw and a home-built CNC router instead of a piece of equipment that costs more than $100 million in existing automotive process. <laughs> we reduce the cost to make change wherever possible, costs in tooling, machinery, and complexity. This lets us not have to wait three to seven years for the next version of our product. Again, we're able to make changes to any part of the car every seven days. We use distributed collaborative teams. These, again, increase our velocity. And we found that morale is a multiplier for velocity across the team. And the way we organize our teams is the smallest, fastest way to organize an agile team. It's called Scrum. Scrum is a method to manage a team in a very rapid way, and that's exactly how we manage our teams in Team Wikispeed. We do all our work in pairs. This avoids time spent training that's not productive. It also eliminates the need for most types of documentation. Here, Martin Val and Kurt Roy are building one of our engines. They actually both perfectly know how to do it, but they're able to share all that knowledge while working without then having to up-train someone afterwards. We visualize our workflow to identify any time spent not creatively solving problems. The tools we use to do this are all free. <laughs> and none of these existed 10 years ago. That means this approach would have been difficult and maybe even impossible even five years ago. Every industry stands to benefit from this process. And in fact, a probable future is that for businesses to maintain relevancy or even be able to compete, they'll have to adopt this process. So what to do? If you own a business, identify a member of your board of directors to be a process coach for the business, and then add process coaches to your teams. If you're the member of a team, ask your process coach where you can gain efficiencies in your team. And if you're a process coach or a scrum master, Identify the value stream map of your company and sharpen your skills at every opportunity. So what's Wikispeed doing next? We're more than 100 volunteers in eight countries now. We sell cars now, and now we're taking these processes to solve bigger problems, like help eradicate polio, like help develop low-cost medical centers for the developing communities. Join Team Wikispeed and let's change the world. You'll sharpen your agile skills and make a difference in the world around you. But even cooler than that, I invite everyone here to spend two hours a day, even just two hours a week, rapidly solving problems for social good. Many of the members of Team Wikispeed spend between two and eight hours a week helping us rapidly develop our cars. And we've had phenomenal and regular successes with it. You, we build ultra-efficient cars. One of you might help eradicate rotavirus. 
or develop simple, maintainable, distributed banking applications for the developing world. And that might be even cooler than watching TV or coaching Little League. If everyone in this room spent even just two hours a week rapidly solving problems for social good, it would be so awesome. <laughs> it would be like a gorilla high-fiving a shark in front of an explosion. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>